So I would like to welcome you here on this meeting, which is one of the series we are organizing through last years, actually also with help of uh, uh, Jakub Frank, who is also attending the session. <laughs> He's going to control me, so hopefully it's going to be fine. <laughs> We started this platform uh, quite a lot of uh, quite a long time ago, actually, after 2012, uh, connected with Central European Forum and establishing Central European Collection and also the research in the whole area and uh, region and so on, and also in the interest connecting the people around. Yeah, Patricia joined, so uh, welcome. <laughs> I'll give you uh, space uh, in a minute. Uh, so we started the platform uh, quite a long time ago, but during COVID era, we started with the program focusing on new media arts, actually, and we uh, somehow reinvented uh, the whole platform. Uh, for the purposes also, what we are doing now, at least in my opinion, is somehow also going back, not just differentiating between new media arts and, let's say, classical art or the art of 20th century, but somehow connecting them both. And the other aspect is uh, connecting a curatorial work and a conservative, uh, conservator's work somehow, because I think more and more in contemporary arts, they are connected necessarily. So uh, this overlaps and interest in works of others, I mean, working in the team and so on is kind of interesting for us. Uh, so I'm very glad that you are on board and we can discuss it. The idea is, and we'll see if it's going to work or not, to organize something like a tea time workshop uh, in three months or half a year or something like that, just to meet and discuss what we are interested in or what we are working on and building this kind of a net, which might be somehow also educational uh, for us, I mean, in institutions, uh, as a curator, as uh, restorers and so on. So with Dunia Stevanovic, who worked with me uh, on one project, Zdeněk Beran's uh, reinstallation, <laughs> uh, kind of really maybe a reworking of the work uh, in the third uh, 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 millennial. Uh, we would like to present this as a first paper and then give you space to present your work. Uh, it might be older one, it might be something we are uh, currently also reworking and rethinking and so on. I'm uh, very glad that Anna Olszewska also joined us because I'm very much interested for <laughs> some time now in her project of Resenstr and the whole, let's say, work around it. But there are many others with Patricia we've met uh, on another opportunity, uh, but also organized on this platform. Uh, it was more connected with the university and teaching stuff, actually. Um, this is also uh, a project which included Jana Horakova, uh, who is connected to Masary Masaryk University and Vashulka Kitchen. So somehow we are meeting again on this platform, but with new people and new institutions, which is kind of uh, rewarding, I think. So hopefully it's going to work somehow for all of us. And uh, for the introduction, I hope this is all. If you have any question, any comments, just <laughs> you can just say it. it's a very open platform. And as I said before, I'm kind of nervous. So <laughs> I think I would like to deal with Beran as quickly as possible right now. <laughs> Uh, I'll start and describe uh, the uh, interpersonal work, uh, curatorial work, uh, work on this, and then I would give uh, space to Dunia, who would um, somehow, you know, put it on, on earth, I would say. Uh, on a material level and so on. What we did uh, in the last few years is reinstallation or maybe also interpretation of a project of Zdeněk Beran, uh, project become, which comes from the actually uh, beginning of 70s of 20th century. It's kind of a, leg a legendary installation or maybe environment which was actually produced in his homeless space on a context of unofficial scene, totalitarian era, and whatever you can imagine with that uh, connected. It was a real installation, material one, and so on. And we actually produce it again uh, like that in a museal context. I'll show you the whole stages or all of the stages. And in the end, I would try to describe our way how to interpret it, how to work with it, and maybe also how to think about the environment which somehow produces a completely different interpretation of the situation of atmosphere and so on. But still there should be some sort of a base which is somehow connected uh, with the original piece. So this is my idea. The presentation has 50 slides, but it's more about atmosphere uh, than real information, I mean, on many levels. So hopefully it's going to work somehow. Uh, this is the original situation. Uh, the installation was produced at the end of the uh, 60s, beginning of 70s in Prague, uh, in Karlin actually, which was in that time the area which was outside the city center, a really a little bit of uh, lost space, let's say. And the atelier actually belonged to other artists of the unofficial scene, Chesmir Janoshuk, who uh, very recently emigrated just after the start of normalization. We uh, all know about Prague in uh, 1968. So this is the situation we are entering somehow. And this is the installation which Beran produced in this kind of a political and historical context. 
it was also the installation which was connected with his experience of uh, one kind of, let's say, bizarre psychiatric experiments. Uh, it was experiment which was somehow focused on um, progressive artists, let's say, 25 of them, which were selected for tests, uh, interviews, screenings, and so on. And this kind of personal approach was also focused on the artworks. And the question was how really the artistic um, spirit, let's say, or creative personality works with the artwork, how it, produ how it, how it he or she produces the language and so on. Of course, there were um, like 20 men and five, uh, five women only. So it was really very much focused on this, uh, let's say, uh, not generally uh, uh, correct enough uh, uh, approach, but on the other hand, also uh, on a progressive art, uh, which was in that time something which wasn't able to be presented in a public space, which was somehow hidden. Part of the uh, Stanislav Drvota, who's the uh, leading psychiatrist, was uh, our, uh, our historian Jan Kriš, actually, who uh, worked with all these artists, uh, prepared their exhibition during the 60s, but starting of 70s, they again became part uh, of the Jan official scene and weren't, um, weren't somehow established in public space as such. So it's kind of an obscure situation from the start. This installation works in the space, which is somehow hidden in the center or outside the center of a Prague, like a, a historical city, let's say, very surrealistic, uh, connected with mannerism and Baroque architecture and so on. And it somehow grows in this kind of inner space in a building, actually. And this is a real uh, psychiatric space in the end, with beds, with bodies and so on. And somehow also establishing the atmosphere, you can see the shadows, uh, which are here. It's not a theatrical exhibition, of course, or something like that. It's, it's not a gallery, a gallery space. It's something which is built in a homely space, actually, in a safe space. On the other hand, the uh, installation itself wasn't presented anyway uh, till the end of 90s. Actually, it was still somehow open just to the... Uh, to his friends and to his colleagues, let's say, some of the visitors coming from outside, but nothing else. So it really is from the start situation with, which is absurd, I would say. And this is what happens with the installation during the 90s when the situation changes, uh, when uh, it becomes also part of the exhibition space. Uh, but between these two uh, phases, actually, so many happens and the changes in the installation also are so um, uh, important and so again, uh, very heavily formed in this material itself uh, that I would like to show you the whole way and also the result uh, which we somehow uh, presented in Olomouc uh, during this deal. So this is just the starting situation. We have this kind of installation in the 70s and then we have something like that in the 90s. Uh, this is maybe the interpretation, interpretation, interpret something like a base for interpretation. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> I'm still same nervous, I would say. Base for the interpretation. Uh, there are quite a lot of texts actually coming from the 60s to 90s. We are always, which are always dealing with Beren and his installation project as something which is from the past or from the some sort of a hidden space, let's say, or something like that, and which is not able to approach on a normal level, which we are still somehow just seeing through the keyhole or something like that, like uh, looking into the past or maybe to a different reality or something, uh, some sort of an inner space. And also with this kind of voyeuristic quality, something which, which we shouldn't see, actually, which is not for us, uh, which is in uh, some sort of a head or a scary space. So this is the, let's say, third version or third possibly, uh, possibility how to deal with it. On one level, we have this kind of env environment, which is historically ba based, conceptually based and so on. On the other, we have this kind of mess <laughs> we are receiving uh, uh, through the material and how it works, actually, and how it was dealt with. And then we have this kind of imaginative or conceptual space. We are somehow rebuilding and thinking through it about the original artwork. This is the context. Uh, I uh, would imagine that people are from this context would know it very well, just have to some sort of idea about material, about um, uh, about the context of informal and how the uh, works work actually uh, through the 60s. The interest in material as such, informal, tashim, and so on, is somehow uh, really present here. And it was also used with uh, unofficial scene as something to uh, be connected with, but also uh, to oppose uh, the regime, of course, abstract art, formal art, working with material as such. And also, on the other hand, this kind of existential level, which is, of course, connected with Kafkaskian system we are living in uh, in that time, of course. 
On the other hand, there are other artists who are somehow uh, rehabilitating a figure uh, and a body as such and coming back to realistic or pictorial realism as such after socialist realism and working also with symbolic, um, symbolic language. On the other hand, activism performance happening, opening the space of the art and somehow thinking about opening field of sculpture also with Milan Knižák and his first paintings, but also entering the public space as such. And maybe with uh, Eva Kmentova as uh, somebody who deals with materials which are cheap, without, which are somehow also found somewhere and somehow dealt with in private spaces, working with one's own body and this kind of physical aspect which is connected with that, but on the other hand, which is something also objective and we all share it in the end. Or maybe Adriana Shimotova again rebuilding this image of ourselves. What does it mean to be mirroring something? What, what does it mean to be part of a society? What does it mean to be a subject in this kind of a context? Uh, Jiřina Čeracký is uh, uh, the artist who is mostly connected with pop art actually and really thinking uh, of the figure of a body as such. And this kind of installation which were produced at the end of 90s, uh, 80s, I'm sorry about uh, that in the end of 80s actually also uh, somehow uh, were prepared with uh, Zdeněk Baran actually and I'll get back to it uh, later and uh, somehow re-established the whole situation, the public space, questioning the public space, and again, what uh, the subject mean uh, in this kind of a context. The final uh, contextual image is a performance, very famous one of Tomáš Ruler, working again in the real public space, but somehow uh, rethinking the, re the space as an image or some sort of visual net uh, we are entering as bodies and so on. And with this kind of approach, which is very dramatic, which is also very, uh, let's say, <laughs> focused on a body, which is something like a material which we are destroying and so on, and reconnecting with the area uh, around it. So this is basic context I wanted to somehow show you. So you can imagine the situation Beran dealt with actually and was part of it also and was discussing with these people his approaches, his thinking about the artwork uh, and so on. Zdeněk Beran was born in the 30s uh, and it means that he really went as a child through the experience of the Second World War, of course. He uh, was studying at the Academy of Fine Arts in the 50s and was establishing himself uh, on a professional level during the 60s, which means that 50s and 60s or maybe 50s mostly or the end of 40s and 50s is the, let's say, first normalization he was dealing somehow with. He wasn't part of a public space. He was part of the unofficial scene from the start, actually, actually developing this kind of uh, new language, his own language, very often, at least from the start, connected with abstract art, with material as such, with informal dashism and this kind of thinking. But on the other hand, through the 60s, he somehow developed the interest in illusionism, in figure, in uh, representational art also. And at the end of 60s, which is kind of important and also interesting, uh, he was part of the uh, Paris Biennale for uh, youth, uh, for young artists. And then uh, he uh, um, he really found out the object. I mean, the object was part of the scene uh, through the 60s, actually, thanks to Pierre Restani and other theoreticians coming not just from France, but it was also something which was developed through the material as such. So at the end of 60s, he's coming back from Paris, actually, which is kind of interesting also for him just to see the global space, of course. And he's coming with, uh, let's say, the knowledge that the object is something which is for the future. Uh, like the image or the painting is something which is old and we should forget it, actually. And through the 70s, he's starting to work. I think this is the base with this installation in his atelier, actually. And this second normalization he's going through is something which is also uh, on a psychological level, extremely interesting and important for him. I think he's really seeing it from the inside and but also from the outside and somehow connecting both on some sort of aesthetic uh, level. Uh, I'm talking here about Baroque aesthetic, but it doesn't have to be just that. I think it's much more complex and I'll go to Michel Foucault and others because I think this is much more about modern culture and modern society and what does it mean to be looking at ourselves and be watched somehow from outside. So in this in-between space is something that uh, is interesting for, uh, for him in this, uh, in this moment. 
Uh, the installation, as I said, was something um, really produced uh, in mind uh, at the end of the uh, 60s. This uh, experiment, which was led by Stanislav Derota, was actually uh, produced in the time, 68, 69. So really in that very, very tricky time of political changes. And the book itself was published at the beginning of 70s. So it really started to be presented somehow with the start of normalization. And this is very, again, interesting because then we can see how the normalization really was established quite slowly. It really took some time, uh, this change of political uh, thinking, let's say, also the maybe um, establishing new set of rules and so on. On the other hand, because it's kind of interesting that it was possible to publish it. On the other hand, what is also interesting and connected with that uh, is this kind of objectification, which was really present in the society, uh, which really meant that the society or parts of the society were somehow measured, really put in this kind of net uh, and defined somehow. Um, and also this connection between creative mind, which is open, always interactive, always changing, and very often impossible to be somehow, you know, uh, really named or you know, put into some sort of sentences and so on, is uh, right away just declared as it is, as it works, like it really would be viewed and also defined in one way, uh, in one moment. Uh, I'm mentioning this on this slide also the name of Jan Krzysz, who was very, very important at the time, a uh, theoretician coming from the younger generation. And actually, I really think he was somehow establishing the whole theory of the field, very much connected with surrealism, which I think should be reinterpreted uh, now because we are a little bit, uh, a little bit, a little bit uh, uh, more distance from this kind of interpretation, which was also, uh, on the other hand, working with these uh, two levels of language and mixing the meaning and so on, and somehow, uh, again, uh, putting us back in the context of a material, something like um, material which has some sort of a tendency to also build a meaning, let's say, which is, again, important for uh, the first interpretation of Beran's work. So this is the installation. You saw the first image, at least, uh, and I would like to show you more details. What is also interesting uh, is the document documentation of the whole project, because there are many, many sets of photographs always dealing with the whole situation, which is, of course, during the 20 years, because the situation really was like that till the beginning of 90s, um, uh, in the beginning of 90s, 92, 93, the installation was uh, put in the exhibition space. But till then, for 20 years, it was just like that uh, in the atelier, and it was slowly degrading and changing and in the space itself. There was some uh, leakage of water <laughs> and other things, and it was still about this kind of destroyment. And I think Dunia will also speak about it a little bit, so I'll give her uh, that space at least. There are more details. You can see how naturalistic it was on one level. Really, it is working with material which is very haptic, on one hand also erotic, because this uh, torso you can see now, they are uh, openly uh, erotic on some levels. They are also haptic very much. You can imagine the situation, you are touching it uh, because it's so realistic on one level and on the other, it's, uh, it's uh, very much imaginative somehow. Uh, so this is, yeah, sorry. This is the other slide, Wait, sorry for that. And there is always the question, but I'm going back to the environment and how we can work with it actually, not necessarily now, but let's say through the 90s, when it was still somehow intact and possibly presented in a gallery space. There's always the question, what is part of the installation and what is a part of the environment itself? Because as I said, it was atelier. So there were quite a lot of things which were just shifting and moving through the installation itself. And uh, just to make a list of parts, uh, we should present like that is a little bit complicated. But uh, what we have for the, uh, and the other thing actually is that uh, Beran died in 2014 and uh, he, of course, in between uh, that moved from one atelier to the other. So the parts really changed. And I think it wasn't even clear for him what is the strict part of the installation, what is the part of the environment and the living space. This is a final image actually coming from the uh, middle of 80s, I think, after that water leakage I was mentioning, and you can see uh, even in the time that it's partially, partly destroyed. So it's something which is somehow uh, also living in the space, so, which is kind of nice, or maybe not necessarily nice, it's a little bit uncanny uh, uh, image. The, um, the whole installation is some, something which is living, which uh, is an organism, let's say, which is also shifting and moving in the space. 
and which should be uh, really, uh, as I'm going to the, back to the same uh, interpretation, uh, watched through some sort of a keyhole or peephole or something like that, which shouldn't be somehow uh, intervened maybe necessarily. Uh, the second uh, phase uh, is connected with, uh, with reinstallation in the beginning of 90s, 91, 92, 93. Uh, this kind of thinking, what should be done with the environment, which is actually the biggest of this kind uh, in the whole Central Europe, what should be done with that, which is kind of also legendistic. Uh, everybody knows about it, but not so many people already saw it and so on. Uh, the, uh, the answer was quite simple, actually, and it was <laughs> put on this kind of a uh, pile as part of it actually. And it was, it's this kind of installation, it really is called Pile, uh, was part of the exhibition which was um, uh, established or produced uh, as part of ICA Congress in the time and for ICA critics actually traveling through Central Europe. Uh, the installation was uh, produced by a group uh, backwards called backwards, but all of these artists connected with the group actually was the masters. I really use this word specifically because they also call themselves masters, ironically, of course, but they were painters, they were uh, sculptors, they were uh, yeah, basically these two options, uh, visual artists as such. Pavel Nešleha, Hugo de Martini. Hugo de Martini, if you uh, remember him or know him, uh, you imagine this kind of this white columns, for example, and minimalistic installation and conceptual art actually in public spaces and perform performances in natural spaces, for example, and so on. Pavel Nešleha was a painter was really very much interested in romantic painting and this kind of emotional and atmospheric stuff and was uh, using illusionistic painting for this some um, kind of approach to the public actually. Again, absolutely perfect atmospheric works. Uh, and then Bedřich Dlouhý, <laughs> my favorite one actually. This is uh, really, I would say, most interesting painting from his context, something which is really, it, which was also destroyed and then reestablished again. So this kind of destroyment and reestablishing something like that, again, uh, working with illusion and so on, is something which was really very much vivid in this context. So in that moment, the installation was destroyed. Uh, you can see the bed here and some other parts around. I show you more details. It was something which was like a material put on this kind of a pile. On the other hand, this pile was also meant uh, like uh, something ritualistic. The best is given, the best is destroyed. And uh, it was also connected with this kind of atmosphere, of course, of 90s, like the history ended, of course. Uh, and uh, we are entering the space where nothing like that actually um, um, mean anything anymore. There was also the generational shift and finding between generation and this man, of course, in the time where around the 50s, beginning of 60s. So there was also this kind of the feeling that they are out of the fashion uh, with the work they are doing. Uh, then the third uh, uh, part comes, or the third fate, uh, phase comes, and it's the installation. And there is nothing to be done anymore with the work. So what we can do in the end is somehow, uh, let's say, bury it. <laughs> and one special space were uh, chosen for that. It was Bread of uh, Chateau, Bread of Castle uh, in Lemberg where uh, some sort of symposiums are focused on sculpture were organized by Jakub Kashe in the 90s. And this is the situation. <laughs> what Beran did actually, he really produced this kind of, you know, uh, like really small church or <laughs> something like that, burial spot, let's say, a ritualistic space. And into that uh, spot, everything was put somehow. Everything was destroyed and really put in that space. And it was really buried. Here you can see also Stanley Beran. He really liked the situation. I think he really liked <laughs> destroyment <laughs> and thinking through this kind of a mess and messy stuff. This is also something which is mm, present in his paintings. And I'll show you them uh, later. So this is what we have in that moment in the middle of the 90s. Uh, the interesting thing is that he tried to present it as an, another image, I would say. Also, the pile is some sort of a painting, if I'm thinking about it, painting in the space uh, with more out offers, let's say, or uh, multi-imaginational stuff, something like that. But it's still somehow an image, I would say. And something like that is also happening in Lemberg. It's, again, some sort of an image. Uh, which is mirroring somehow uh, in the space, which is playing with illusion and so on, which is also very much atmospheric. And what Beran did actually, he used these glasses, which somehow closed the whole installation, which were, of course, very quickly destroyed themselves. So it was all buried in the end as such. And it was like that. Yeah, this is the perfect stage, actually, or maybe the perfect uh, moment 
but as I said before, it was very quickly destroyed. And what uh, then happened is that uh, this kind of arrangement actually was like that for next five years. Uh, and then uh, the final stage comes, uh, end of 90s, uh, when quite a lot of people like Bedrick Lohi and others, uh, Milan Knižák, were thinking about what happened with this kind of environment. When did they end it, actually? What's happening with it anymore? And if it would be possible to somehow bring it back, we are in the moment when installation art is something which is really present everywhere. It's something which is very much up to date. Everybody's interested in that exhibition is not about or exhibiting is not about presenting sculpture or final pieces, but thinking about inside spaces uh, and environments themselves. And the question, where is this kind of a legendary uh, environment we have, all of us know, actually, uh, where is it now and what shall we do uh, about it? So they decide to uh, bring it up and uh, move it to the National Gallery and present it as part of a permanent collection, actually. And then uh, Beran's monographic exhibition. This is what they found. Uh, it was really an arche archaeological <laughs> surroundings. I would say they really dealt with the material on a professional level. Uh, this is what happened with it, actually. It was put like that outside um, the earth. And then they put it in the National Gallery. So this is the presentation um, way of representing as part of the uh, permanent exhibition. You can see at least partially what's around it. It wasn't properly documented, which is also interesting. So we have the, only this kind of documentary photography, which gives us some sort of a hint. Mm -hmm. This is the installation of a, some sort of a grave, which was put in the space of the National Gallery. And this is what um, uh, somehow... I would say is in, is interpretation of the mess, uh, what do we have, uh, and how we can really present it um, as something which might be, uh, for some time at least, be part of the permanent collections. Uh, I think it's an interpretation which was somehow discussed between Beran and Knižák as the director of the National Gallery. Uh, it's a classical Lotech glass box, and in that is installation which again somehow works with this kind of pictorial elements and pictorial quality. Uh, it uh, was part of the part of the exhibition which was focusing on Tashism and informal. So somehow it was part of the painterly collection. Uh, you can see there parts of the bodies. You can see there other properties, parts of the bedding, uh, also uh, suitcases, which were very important for Beran. Uh, this kind of a symbol of emigration or moving through the time, symbol of 20th century, actually, losing home and so on. So it was really somehow put together on an aesthetic level. Again, this kind of aesthetic approach was very much interesting and also important for us when we dealt with this installation. Uh, now I would like to show you how we get to the interpretation itself. Uh, this is what Beran produced actually through the 70s, quite a lot of drawings which were always somehow reinterpreting or working with this kind of stuff. He knew himself this is something special and specific, of course. So he had rethink the whole situation and what would be possible actually to do with this kind of setting. And he actually dealt with it also, not just in the drawing series, but also in other installation. Olomouc Museum of Art uh, has one of them, uh, Game of Heads, uh, which somehow works with the same idea, subject is somehow, somehow uh, also the most problematic thing, thing of a society or a collective, and this kind of tension which is in between. On the other hand, pictorial level and pictorial organization, illusion, atmospheric stuff, which is connected with that, again, is very much important here. Uh, this is the spatial installation, the only one he dealt with actually uh, during the normalization era. Uh, this is 1988. It's the same exhibition I was mentioning in connection with uh, Nacheratsky. And um, uh, the other one was Terezin, uh, which somehow shows how he fought actually in the space in the end when he dealt with drawings and what was possible then in the real space. Uh, other images, so we can see that he somehow again, following the same path. Maybe you can also see in this installation, uh, Josef Jankovic, for example, and some other artists who are dealing with a human figure in space. This is other element, um, but I'm always focusing, or he was always interested in models and modeling. And I also think it was not just practically a reason, but also something like we always have a model in hands, right? We are owning the world or something like that when you have a model. So some uh, this kind of approach was very much important for him as well. And you also can see this kind of perspective net he is using. 
uh, another set of drawings, which somehow reworks uh, this kind of thinking through the model. And then the final chapter comes. Uh, Zdeněk Beran was a painter from start till the end. And this kind of working with painting is something which is really re-establishing world uh, was super important for him. So these are works from the middle of the 90s. Highly illusionistic, on the other hand, you don't know necessarily what you are looking at. It's just a sort of material and detailed material you are dealing with. And this is, um, let's say, post-conceptual approach, which we're always connecting this kind of uh, space with something which is illusionistic painted and which really asks the question what the painting is, what the image is, which, uh, what the representation actually means and how we are dealing with painting as a medium uh, in some moment. Now I would like to enter the moment of interpretation um, because this is the point of the whole presentation. And I will start with the peephole, with the keyhole we are looking for or through uh, to the installation itself. This is a model which was uh, prepared by Zdeněk Beran, uh, Zdeněk Tres and some other students of original uh, Beran's uh, atelier at the Academy of Fine Arts in the 90s and after 2000. So you can see some sort of a model of the original situation which was uh, in the end uh, presented in the exhibition we uh, produced uh, as a peep hole, as some sort of voyeuristic space. Uh, so we are really looking through this kind of a hole uh, into the past. And this is the installation itself. Hopefully you can see it. Uh, the installation itself, uh, what we brought from the National Gallery, because mostly this is a uh, uh, property of the National Gallery. This is also the reason why uh, we uh, so much cooperated with Dunia uh, Stevanovic. Uh, only some of the parts uh, belong to the Olomouc Museum of Art. So this is the first moment after 20 years uh, uh, since these parts uh, were somehow put together. Uh, what belongs to the Olomouc Museum of Art is this kind of a torso uh, in the front, which is intact. It wasn't buried. Uh, and it was a decision of Jakub Kasia, the organizer of the symposium. Uh, in Lemberg, and then one suitcase, uh, which you'll see in a minute. So we established this kind of aesthetic level, aesthetic platform, uh, which somehow works with the notion of a grave, and actually it somehow also works with other faces. Uh, it somehow uh, puts together installation as a spatial object, as an environment, let's say. On the other hand, it's buried and it's installed in this, uh, in this burial site. Uh, the title of the exhibition was Elevation, or is still, because the exhibition still runs for three more days. And this elevation means something really this in this Christological, eschatological uh, 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 moment, this kind of re-establishing the quality, the position, uh, the meaning of a thing, uh, which, we, which we are rediscovering, actually. You can see one bed here. <laughs> Dunia, I think, will also speak about it because the bed is... Oh, the tricky part, I would say. Uh, same goes for uh, for the uh, glass box. Uh, uh, it's all somehow um, very problematic also how to install it, how to work with it. It's just, it might be something for the future also if we shouldn't work with this kind of material on some different level with um, 3D techniques, with new media, for example. And it was, uh, there are quite, a, there are quite, and actually this is the last question of the, of the presentation, so I'm um, uh, too quick again. But uh, the question is if we shouldn't build a different surrounding actually for it, if we shouldn't follow, let's say more documentary aspect or approach and present it uh, on a different field. But what we decided actually, uh, is to come up with some radical interpretation again. There were four radical chapters, four radical phases of the artwork, and it was always rebuilt, refought, uh, rediscovered somehow on a different level with a different aspect, with different uh, moments, also interesting for the artist. What connected them was aesthetic level. It was always about illusion. It was always about atmosphere. It was always about this kind of being in the space and feeling something. Uh, and it's a slightly, uh, with slightly ironic approach, I would say, because Daniel Beran was a very complicated person, and it was he was also playing with you as a viewer somehow. He was pushing you somewhere. So this was another aspect: what the artwork is doing actually, how it's activating us when we are in the space, how we are feeling around it, what we are actually doing uh, when we are with it or uh, without it in the end. Few more uh, uh, images. You can also see this. Um, 
suitcase I was mentioning. It's called Narcissus, actually. And it's kind of element of, again, mirroring and focusing on subjective elements and so on is part of this kind of thinking. So we decided to put it in the installation and again, played with the question, what is the part of the installation itself? What is outside of it? What um, um, brings something to the meaning of the installation? We also put there some, as you can see, documentary images. Uh, there was a, a presentation, small presentation of historical uh, photographs uh, on a tablet. Uh, there were uh, another room with projection, uh, also with film projection, which somehow built the context of the artwork. Okay, some more details. So you have the idea. Uh, this is also, <laughs> we are producing a book, so we are also dealing with this, this kind of details, because this is something, if you remember um, Beran's paintings, this is something he was interested also in, this kind of uh, moment when you, are, when you are somehow recognizing something, but you don't know what does it mean, actually. So we are on this level um, uh, of not knowing what you are seeing, but um, it's argument what you are watching somehow also. Another view of the torso. Uh, one of the aspects of the installation was uh, not just being in the space and moving around and actually uh, the floor was shifting somehow. So you are going up and going down when you uh, walked around the grave, which gives it some sort of uh, physical element, I would say, but also playing with this kind of um, uh, painterly net. Uh, perspective net, which somehow at least gives you the idea that there is some sort of a structure uh, you are part of also, which is organizing you somehow or pushing you or manipulating you. And I'm coming back to Stanislav Devota. This is the final question. <laughs> and with that, I'll give floor to, uh, floor to Junia. <laughs> and I would hope she will answer everything, actually. But this is still the question, I would say. And the work still exists somehow. We have this kind of a glass box. We have a torso. We have uh, a suitcase, let's say, if we are thinking about it as a part of the installation. We have the remnants we are dealing somehow with. And the exhibition, as I said, is ending in three days. So part of it uh, will stay in almost Museum of Art. A part of it is going back to the National Gallery, main part, actually. And the question is, what will happen with this piece? Uh, if it might be, again, somehow presented or not? And how? This is something which is in the air, I would say. I'm very much, I'm really happy that Dunia is somehow on board because I would be interested in to work not just on Beran, but really think about this kind of concepts and environments. And I think it's also super important to think about material level, how we deal with it actually, because it's all plaster and other stuff, which is really something which is really ephemeral. So this is the base I wanted to discuss with you today. And actually, I think we will, we, or we can follow to curatorial stuff. We can follow uh, uh, conservator uh, stuff, how to deal with it, how to protect it. There are many, many possibilities. So for me, this is it. And now uh, I'm open for a question. I would give first floor to Dunia, I guess, and then we can discuss um, what we worked on. Thank you very much. Great job. Thank you. Thank you for a beautiful introduction. I had a small laugh when you said a permanent collection. <laughs> I'm really, really interested. How will that go? But uh, I will try to, to show you or to like uh, slightly show you at least uh, what was my part of it. And it was uh, more or less the bodily part or the material part of it. Okay, so uh, my part was more uh, more about the research, the conservation presentation, and the transport. Of course, that was that was a really fun part of it. I have to say, <laughs> uh, maybe maybe Barbara will will agree. Uh, it all uh, it all started uh, as almost a kinder surprise egg when when I got to the to the depot that we have uh, in in the building that I'm working at. Uh, there was a um, the vitrine that was the main part of the the um, uh, environment wrapped up in plastic <laughs> since the last exhibition. Nobody opened it. Nobody has touched it for years. So then uh, the, the best part of it was to, to unwrap it. <laughs> and, and I have to say, I felt like a child. And uh, because that was the, the first time that everybody anybody was touching it in a, in a really long time. The whole spatial installation is entitled, uh, is it entitled the Rehabilitation Department of Dr. Doctor? And is composed, of course, of several segments. A display case was my main focus. But uh, we also had uh, 13 additional parts, uh, which added to the complexity of Barbara's um, uh, whole, whole work. So uh, my part was, uh, we, we um, immediately decided that uh, the approach to the whole theme will be conservation. 
and research and uh, the least amount of, of restoration. The whole concept would support that because uh, Beran himself didn't want, well, he, he wanted to see the material uh, uh, compose, to, to decompose, and then hopefully to, to do its own thing and to to do something more than just the material can do. So uh, I I took third no, I took nine samples from it and tried to to research it in in the um, in cooperation with the with the in-house uh, engineers from our own lab. We tried to uh, specify uh, more or less all the materials which were used in this in this vitrine. Uh, one of uh, one of which was a chair, which was a polyester, of course quite visible in the in the first glance that it is polyester but i was interested in is there's anything else other than the the um, metal construction we also found some fibers which were synthetic which was uh, which, which was analyzed of course and you can see it in the in the normal light you will see usually i have slides just like uh, my photos and then the photos from the analysis with the slides in normal light and uv lights uh, which sometimes for me it's maybe the most interesting part of it to to see it in in another light. So the the second uh, sample was the fiber were the fibers of the from the mattress, and that was really really strange because it was proven that it, they were from horse hair completely and covered with epoxy, which um, which combined with the Baron's approach and and artistic. Uh, installation probably proved the point that when he was uh, when he was layering all the layers that he he wanted to to do during the his performance or or uh, or the the whole art um, process he just took uh, different materials and he applied them in layers and layers something similar similar like the oil painting. Uh, so we find we find this uh, epoxy resin uh, pretty much on on every part of the, of this vitrine, uh, and it is visible in in uh, in this uh, greenish yellowish light, um, and the detail of the horse uh, horse hair, <laughs> which I didn't expect to to find there. I, I thought it would be something more of a cotton type. Uh, the third sample was complete. It was uh, simply soil, and of course, it was uh, covered with layers of uh, epoxy resin. As you can see in the details, this soil was probably pulled with. Uh, some of it was pulled from the, let's say, grave when the when the uh, work of art was was buried. But some of it was probably uh, uh, the epoxy was probably uh, layered. On the in the ground when when uh, when they were covering it uh, before the before the um, uh, layers of glass, and then we have the fourth sample, the upper part of torso. Uh, it was on a on the hanger. It, uh, we found cellulose fiber, orga organic paint, and alkyd resin, which is uh, which is in pretty bad shape, uh, relatively decomposed. But you can still see layers of uh, of, the, of different paints and maybe some some tra transport transports of um, transfers of um, rust, the um, cellulose fiber probably gauze or similar, and the alkyd layers with the with the paint layers, all shining shining like the the starry night, um, and then we see the in the upper part of torso that was pretty pretty evident that uh, that uh, the polystyrene polystyrene was was found uh, the foam that was used that was uh, the filling filling part of the mold was the poly polystyrene and then again the epoxy covering the hanger some details uh polyurethane and epoxy resin on top again probably uh, slightly flamed just to to cover or burned, uh, as Barbara was was saying, and in the UV light. For me, as a restorer, it is really fun to see what can you research on your own and compare it with the with the results from the laboratory. So I was quite proud that <laughs> that I uh, that I found almost all the materials as as the laboratory proven to to have there, and this is the detail of the polyurethane mattress. Unfortunately, of course. Uh, highly decomposed, uh, and we have only three more samples. 
uh, of fra fragment of the sculptured piece of torso, calcium carbonate, epoxy resin, antanas, zinc, titanium, titanium white, iron pigments, and nitrocellulose, which will pro probably prove to be one of the one of the worst choices, but probably one of the varnishes that he had on hand and just took from the zero, mixed some paint, and just continued painting painting. But the but the state of the of the work of art is pretty rough. It, it's roughed up because of all the transfers and so on. And we tried uh, when when I was doing the trans the transport, I was trying to um, isolate the pieces, the, the problematic ones, as much as we could to save most of it. This is quite fortunate to have a vitrine like this, you know, like a closed chamber, because you can you can be completely safe and and uh, sure that you saved all the pieces, at least not in the same place maybe, <laughs> but they are all there, and sustained, uh, pro hopefully the minimal uh, minimal stress. They were there were uh, quite uh, quite interesting results with uh, again nitrocellulose binder. Uh, different uh, epoxy resins, antanas, calcium carbonate, carbonate. Again, uh, a lot of resins, which he he again found in the studio probably or chosen to to use and applied to his work of art. This is a similar. Uh, the whole work of art, as you can see it, was uh, processed in similar matter. So you can you can see it. Um, with similar, we, you can see similar materials repeating in a pattern. Again, with the unorganic materials, but nitrocellulose nitro binders, alkyd resin, again with the epoxy, and so on. And this here is a, a sample of the foil layer with the PVC, with the epoxy, again, mixed with the, with the iron minerals, calcium and alumin aluminum base, which uh, sounds a little bit uh, strange, but pro probably it was an aluminum foil, which was used to cover the, the plaster or to cover the, the um, polystyrene and then to form on top of it. Yes, this is, I have to say my conclusion was uh, I, I I was really enjoying the whole uh, research and uh, and I was enjoying uh, the whole process of um, having the vitrine open. Yes, that that's the thing that I want to mention. When I opened the vitrine, I realized the 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 smell of it came puffing to me. It was a slightly urine, slightly plasticizers type of smell. <laughs> It was uh, interesting to 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 have in mind that uh, it is a work of art which was closed, and you can you can really uh, enjoy all the all the uh, not only materials um, decomposing, but you can process all the emo emotions and all the time uh, that an artist and maybe others spend there. So regarding all of that and regarding my research, I have to say it, uh, and prior prior history to the work, it can be assumed that uh, it was not the artist's intent at all to preserve the insulation in its original form. Uh, that was my baseline. And as such, the aim of the current work is not to, to do a faithful reconstruction, but rather to conserve it, to observe it, and to document it. And to, well, it's hard to, to, to say and to, to admit, to slowly uh, see it decompose. <laughs> before my eyes, uh, but hopefully I will be here still uh, to document it at least. Uh, and uh, in my plans, I have uh, to do a 3D scan, hopefully to, to see uh, the, the shifts in the materials, if not, uh, not, uh, not only like three inches there, three inches here, but but maybe, and well, hopefully at the end of my career, I will see this <laughs> polyurethane foam <laughs> crumbling <laughs> on the on the bottom of the vitrine, or like I, I would like to see some changes or the polystyrene starting to to bubble up or or uh, anything. Uh, these changes maybe uh, maybe just like the the transfer from from matter to gas, as as I already smelled them in the beginning. Or maybe they will be more visible. I'm I'm open to everything and looking forward to it. I have to say, thank you, Barbara, for inviting me and to for proposing the the whole idea. I really enjoyed it. That's that's uh, just <laughs> a highlight. And thank you for attention.
Thank you very much, Dunya. It was lovely. Thank you. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. It was super interesting and it still is super interesting. So we'll see what happens next. Uh, we'll have uh, time in discussion and we are a little bit um, uh, over the shadow as I talk too much. But uh, what I wanted to mention is that uh, the project is part of the digitization, uh, another dig digitization actually project. So you will definitely deal with the new media stuff and uh, digitization itself. And also there is a space for Dunya to deal with um, uh, analysis and data she's collecting somehow. So uh, this is again something which is kind of adventurous, I would say, to work with it, to try to present it somehow on a, not necessarily online space, but as a data, uh, somehow visualized also, uh, because there should be this kind of uh, aesthetic and sensual element. But uh, this is also the question how we will deal with it. So this is this first chapter, I would say, for now. Thank That's you for that. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.